Now, on one of our five trips to Texas, Bill Rutherford, the late Bill Rutherford, arranged that we could visit a friend of his who lived in a private community that had its own airport. And this gentleman was the most interesting person I have ever met in terms of he did the restoration. He purchased this, this airplane from the Dutch. He did the total restoration. He has the combat records where it served in Poland, in, in several other venues. He did the whole restoration under his in the shop in Texas. And it's the only Spitfire, and uh, if I'm not misinterpreting this, ever restored in the United States to this level. It was a Dutch gate guard. The whole story of this, now the beginning of it is very interesting. It begins with a little tour of the, of the aircraft itself. But the interesting part, and I try to upgrade the footage as much as I can, is his documentation of how he did the restoration and some of the stories at the end, how they made a full-size plastic model of his airplane. The, the P-51D, the only one I've ever, hey, I haven't seen, I flew, that's the only one I've ever flown, it's a D model. Uh, and the D model uh, uh, had an anti-servo tab uh, because uh, when it's up cruising, it tended to be crooked. And that anti-servo tab uh, kept it straight the rudder? on the rudder, mm -hmm. but it also gave you hell on takeoff because you put full rudder trim in it and then you s just stood on the damn thing with your right foot. Uh, this thing is, is pretty damn docile on takeoff. It's mm -hmm. much more docile than I, uh, than I was used to with the 51. Or in every but you can see out of the 51 when you're playing. <laughs> this son of a bitch, you don't see either. Ship it from Holland yeah. six thousand dollars. Was do you, you put it in a container? Yeah, I put it in a shipping container. Twenty foot, twenty foot shipping. And uh, you know, hell, they just picked it up. And they delivered it right out here on the road, and we took it out yeah. and put it on tables that we built. Actually, great big old hidden tables. And we just stuck the airplane on it, wheeled it in yeah. in pieces. But a twenty foot container for me from China was about six thousand dollars. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazingly cheap. Now, I, I, of course, I had to go over there and disassemble this damn thing and yeah. build all the forms to hold it and everything. But uh, I had to, I had some pretty good help. Uh, I was going to call me. I was available. <laughs> <laughs> but it, we're available now, right? But it, uh, it has, uh, uh, it has been an ordeal to get to most of the boats out of it. How many hours of flying does it have on it? Uh, I don't know. It had 161 combat hours, and I've flown it 98 hours since I finished. It's really got about 300. A and uh, I don't have any idea of the non-combat hours it flew because mm -hmm. the logs, the aircraft logs, were destroyed in 1958. Uh, the uh, uh, so I, I have no way of knowing what its total time is. The, uh, but I have all the combat records on the airplane. I have every scrap of paper. And uh, uh, it's really interesting to go through them. It shows every mission. Did you, buy from, did you buy this from the RAF? Or? No. Uh, it, uh, this airplane was sold to uh, the Dutch in 1946. H1. Looking at the bottom of the wing here for some of the detailing. Joe would probably be interested in this. But I've got pictures of it in a very nice construction phase. The corrosion was just terrible. On the, this wing was the first wing we did. The invasion stripes. And uh, it took us a year and a half to do this wing. Uh, and we replaced about 60% of it, all the spars. All the all the ribs in the rear the corners and the strip and the shrink and the wood shrink and the stretch. Hi, I'm ready to go. Hi, Joe. Hi, Joe. Nice to meet you, Clint. Hi, Clint. This is my wife's name. We need the rest. 
restoration on this is lawless. This, this is unbelievable. I'll tell you, talk about being worth the trip, huh? You know, I'll tell you, if you were going to build another spit, it would be cool the to make. Detail in here would be. Accurate. Yeah, yeah. I got to mention to Joe. I mean, we you could, could you could get in here with some decent light, photograph the instrument panel, create all this. You know, in the this is see. This is a nice paint job too with the. Uh, hmm? You know, look at that with the invasion stripes, the cannon blisters. The Mark Nine. Look at when it, to, just look at all the detail in the filling. Oh, I know. You, you got a little bump here, a little blister there, rivet lines. It's absolutely immaculate. You got to see. You can't believe how you can rub this and you can feel the paint line. Unbelievable. This is really, really adds a dimension to uh, the word museum quality. Look at this. They even have a hatch for adjusting a control horn in the back. Really? Ha! Huh. They call it waiter ballast. Yeah. But yeah. they even have a. Ah. To work with. What's what's impressing the hell out of me is how clean it is. No, I see what he meant when he, when he said he had a flap part. Yeah, yeah. They, they're waiting for some flap parts to be machined. Look at this detail for a yeah. light light ink job. Yeah, Joe has this on his. Joe has this on his uh, Spitfire. He made a copy of this, a pattern. And of course, Joe. He has a picture of you, your Spitfire, my, my Spitfire, right in his shop, in his laundry basket, in fact. How cool is that? There's other planes in here. Think about taking wheel pants apart that way? No. That's pretty cool. This looks like a V-tail home built back there, but, but to be honest, the Spitfire has got my attention. Without a doubt. It's a nightmare to clean. I mean, we can't clean. And she leaks. You can keep this clean. It's okay. It's pretty cool, huh, John? One of these days, I'm going to get my zero back from John. Yeah, I've got to take my short hair. Zero's a paint shot behind my hand. I'm going to work here. Oh, the regulars are not staying fast. Well, yeah, I'm telling you, you. That's some workmanship, boy. That's yeah. that's. It's a wooden prop. Yeah, yeah, he said. Yeah. Made in Germany. So what kind of wood is that prop made out of? Do you know? And you know, I don't know. It's got some kind of finish or a tape on the leading edge. It's got to be laminated. Some kind of tape or vinyl on the leading edge. Look at the prop tips, and they're reversed. Of course, this engine turns backwards. No. No. Normal. Turns normal rotation? Yeah. Would would these normally turn the other way? No. Or the five blades turn the other way? What? Uh, the Griffins? No, I think the Griffin went this way too. Most British airplanes went the other way, but the, the uh, Merlin did not. Oh. This is a Rolls Royce. Yeah, Rolls Royce Merlin. Yeah. Yeah. You see, this had uh, 200 and some odd more horsepower than the Mustang. And it's wow. lighter. And it's lighter. But it, what, what, what this could do for an hour, Mustang could do for eight. Right. <laughs> well, you, now you know I'm a Mustang fan, but you know for an hour, that'd be the fun thing ever. <laughs> Most of the time, what they were doing was over with in about 10 minutes. Yeah, it's kind of, kind of overkill to say. The other seven hours weren't real interesting. Well, these guys, they were defending. They weren't going somewhere. <laughs> yeah. 
Here comes the they had to take a ride. They didn't have to go to Germany to get a fist yeah. fight going. Guys yeah, yeah. did not want to give up their Spitfires for Mustangs. They did not want to do it. Well, Bill, I don't want to give up my Spitfires for Mustangs either, but I'll take a Bearcat. <laughs> Boy, this is a treat, Bill. I appreciate you uh, lined this all up. It's unbelievable. Oh, yeah, he, this is he something goes special. An like we it took so long to get here. Well, we can forgive that. I may erase some of that out of the video where I was court cursing you out and saying, "Who the hell is this guy?" You're not the first guy. To <laughs> Don't worry You're about it. The last. You check the right thing in here. Yes, Les looked at it. Where, where are you? I'm the leading edge in the in the black and white stripe. One of those things that look like staples, but they're really openings. Staples, but they're really openings. There's a strip. A lot of screw head. The what? It's other slot screws. And kind of like a cam-shaped screw it's top. It's a He just got item all lined up. Okay. Yeah, you just got them all exactly Oh, yeah. Look at this, all the slots are, are angled up evenly. <laughs> this is unbelievable, I got it. And of course, the other stuff in it, in itself would be interesting, but uh, you march in a Spitfire, especially if Joe and Wendy are around. Now, Joe and I, between us, have made six. Very, very, very cool afternoon here. Just as cool as it gets. Now, the reason I wanted to do some of the smaller details on this, because you never know when Joe and I are gonna just up and make two more Spitfires. You look at the Zeus fittings. It looks like they have four rivets in each Zeus fitting. The exhausts are cool. And of course, I've made four different molds for four different types of these to make composites. And they're always one of the high points of the plane. An RV6? Is it an RV6? I can't tell. Side by side seating. No, Bill's is side by side, right? Yep. It looks like an RV. John, is this an RV? Do you know? It's an RV. I just don't, I, I think it's an RV, but I couldn't be sure about the number. Six, seven, eight, what, five. What would you give to have a hangar like this? Look at this hangar to work, just build models in. Put your, put your O-gauge well, train layout, layout over here. Good to have a desk, a, a work table like Yeah. That, that rolls around. That's right. The light's built in. Work table. Get my O-gauge model railroad over here. All my Brodac kits up over here, all my ARFs over here. All my Spitfires near the Spitfire.
I'm assuming the first thing you need to do if you want to uh, have your own Spitfire, first you need a house on the airport, you need a hangar like this, and you can see you just taxi right out here. How cool is this? You just taxi right out. And of course Spitfires are made to take off on the ground. Look at this, you got your own entry ramp. How cool is that? Is that cool or what? Wow, unbelievable. Not many people I know have this kind of stuff in their backyard. This is really cool. Yeah, and we could see now if I had it, we'd cut that tree down and make a 70 foot. Less. the only thing missing is your own flying circle. I'm sorry? Can you imagine this with all your models hanging up on a wall and out here a 70 foot flying circle? Yeah. Whoa, man, that's, and your model railroad off in the corner there. Oh. I never saw any picture of any spits where I saw the guns mounted like this. The ones, the ones that I modeled, I made those guns. Did you? Yeah, they unscrew out on two 440. Seafire has those. No. This is cool, and when they shoot the gun, they just blow the tape off. There's guns in here, and they just, it's just tape. Really? Yep. Those exhausts got me. They're, they're really cool. Yeah. That's are. a really nice. And you can even see how they're made. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The landing gear details. I know Joe's going to be in, Joe will be playing this over and over again. You do up the gear legs, the doors. It's the first time I've seen a spit, what, see what the sheet metal on the inside edge of the door looks like. Mm -hmm. Look inside those radiators. There's some detailing inside those radiators and they got the dump doors in the back. Yeah, that is, that is one, one very impressive. I don't think the ones I've even seen, even the one in the Dayton Museum is not as clean as this one. This one is clean beyond clean. This is like Testarossa clean. Now Zambelli is going to have something very similar to this down in South Carolina. He's already bought the property. And have his airplane, have his, uh, his piper come right in. Have his own flying field. When you live on an airport, it's hard for people to complain about airplane noise, I guess. Sure. Well, they have an air-conditioned office in here. Let's see what they got going on. What a place. I could spend a week here. If I would have flown it for you guys if I'd have had the thing where I could, uh, where I could fly it, but obviously I can't. Freeman's got a flap out. The uh, flap actuator, the ears broke off on it. So it's have to have, of course it's not available anymore, so it's oh, yeah. especially have to have machine shop making. And uh, this is the flap that went to. Mm. This they is the flap, the actuator uh, sits right here, and that's what broke, the ears broke off of it, and it goes right here and it's bolted on. So it's a small flap. Uh, it's uh, a 90 degree flap, and it's all it's supposed to do is duck the nose. A mm. it, it's not a lift flap. Uh, it's a pure drag flap, and, but I'll guarantee you that thing isn't any fun to land with the flaps up. I've only done it one time and I ain't doing it again. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, you're, you're flying along like this, you're, you can't get your speeds right because this thing is very critical on speed, and particularly coming in here because we only have, you know, we have a high line on one end of the runway yeah. and we only have fence to fence 3,000 feet so with the with the uh, with the high line uh, we have the runway offset where you only have 2,800 feet and so you have to hold your speeds exactly right in this airplane in order to get it on here but I the only time I've ever landed it without flaps I went over to Galveston and landed on oh, the long man. Runway. Nah. <laughs> runway but, uh, yeah. but it, uh, you know, it, if, you, if you're interested at all, I've got 
every kind of book known to man on this thing. This basically, let's see, that's that's the Dutch stuff. Let's see. I prepared a book on this thing for Oshkosh somewhere. I don't know what I did with it. it might be in the other room. You go to shows with this? Huh? Is this like at Oshkosh they have yeah. classes of uh, restoration? And yeah, yeah. And here's, this basically shows getting it, unloading it. Oh. And this is, this is corrosion. Oh, God. Look at the corrosion on this. You might talk about corrosion. Yeah, talk about that. See, this is corrosion. And, we remade all that. And, and so this is when you're taking apart, this is a part of rib one. And what you're looking at is an extrusion. All the extrusions are bad because of the way uh, they heat treated the extrusions back in those days. They did a lousy job. They didn't expect them to last very long. No. And uh, so uh, uh, this here, it shows uh, the jig that we built for the wings. I don't know if we get some good pictures of the jig, but the jig was pretty good size, as you can see. And you're looking at it. There's the wing. It's in the jig. And we're rebuilding each one of the uh, sections. It, le it lent itself to rebuilding in sections. And for instance, this is the wheel well section. Mm -hmm. uh, this right here, we're rebuilding the area right under the uh, uh, right under the radiators, and and we could take these out. And what we did is we we just we we worked our way through all of these sections, jigging each one of them as we went, mm. uh, because you know of course this thing was made specifically for the wing mm -hmm. and luckily the wings were not damaged so that we could use them as a jig and so we used them as a jig and we would we put the whole the whole top on there once we got that done we took it all off and then we rebuilt the D section which is the bottom part and we were able to salvage many of the uh, many of the ribs in the D section and in fact sa uh, salvaged the D section which is 80 thousandths thick. Wow. And uh, and here you know we're we're going back in with the D section frames. You can see them all where we've got it, where we're putting Talk it. Talk about a labor of love. This is <laughs> this shows what just typical. This is the original aileron bell crank. And if you look at it, you can see that's corrosion. And I mean, it was corroded, uh, intergranular type stuff. It's, it, you know, it's just, it's nothing but a pattern. And so this is what we made. You see, he's a self, remember a self-taught master craftsman on this. Mm. Now, what about? Can I ask you a silly question? I uh, because of, I've done a little research on Spitfires. There's places in England that do pretty much what you've done, on a bigger scale, or they do. They, uh, there are two, uh, there's a, a company called Historic Flying that uh, does the system installation and they don't build them up, but what they do is they put in all the systems and they put in okay. the engines and anything like that. There's a company called Airframe Assemblies that basically will build you a new one. And, oh. uh, and uh, uh, they help me a great deal. Okay. Uh, There's a lot of camaraderie in this, just like there is in modeling, where you, one guy helps the other guy. And well, and I and I bought a number of parts from uh, uh, from uh, airframe assemblies, particularly parts that were machined parts. Uh, most of the stuff that wasn't machined, we made ourselves, but uh, the machine parts. Well, what I, What does one have to do to quote unquote salvage an extrusion? Uh, you don't salvage it. Use it for a pattern. You just use it for a pattern. <laughs> and then it, it corrodes it from inside. Huh? Uh, yeah, it right. From inside. We, no, we you said it's a granular. Yeah. Thing. We got the extrusion material from <clears throat> England, and we okay. could buy it in 20 foot lengths. And uh, it was modern extrusion material made with the same extrusion dies as they used back in, in, in uh, England. Ah, okay. And I, I got it from airframe assemblies. <laughs> and, uh, and, then we would cut it and you know we've got stretchers and shrinkers and stuff over there so that we would be able to shrink it or stretch it to the old pattern right and then we would put the ribs together and uh, uh, things like this this is the seat uh, when we started rebuilding it and 
flat it, handle? And that, that's uh, that's the seat adjuster. Oh, okay. Up and down, and uh, it was so corroded underneath, and the, it these these frames here were bent, so we had to make them. But that's what it looked like when we finished. Here we're going into another wing. You can see now how it is in sections. This again is a wheel well section. This is a, uh, the trailing edge section on the uh, left wing. This shows, this is, a, this is the frame that is right outside here. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, uh, I took a picture of it because it had an inspection plate on it. And I put all the plates back on or uh, where they were so screwed up that I couldn't uh, salvage them. I just had new ones made. But this is rib one. Rib one on this aircraft has uh, a little over 350 pieces. Mm. Yes, I mean, it's tip this is a metal, uh, this is a metal airplane that should have been a wood airplane. It's a it's a it's a wood airplane made out of metal. Uh, the uh, basically this uh, is the cannon ammo bay, which we ultimately made into fuel cells. And this is this is your spar. Here we're building it up with the new spars. And here we're still. This is the D section again. Mm -hmm. Here's with all, everything out of it. And then this is the spar after we finished it and put it into the D section. And, you know, it's just a lot of little projects. Just a lot of work. And, and you can see here it's in the jig. You can see how it's set in the jig and how uh, we literally, once we got the D section finished, we had all of these, uh, we had all of these uh, uh, frames done. And we put it together just like that in a day because it's all bolted together. Mm. Just slip it in and bolt it in, put bushings and bolts in. And, uh, uh, but getting to that point, <laughs> yeah. pain in the butt. Then, of course, here we're reskinning it. The problem with the skin, why, the reason it looks like it's got the measles is that there, that aladine tank and that and that etch tank is a is a 55 gallon drum and you can't get it all the way in the damn thing so you end up turning it over and so it I ends do the up same with a five gallon bucket it <laughs> ends up looking like a speckled trout and this is the fuselage now a lot of the fuselage salvaged we didn't salvage any of the exterior skins just because the skins were damaged you cannot straighten out damaged skin. Mm. I mean, I can take a wheel and do a lot of things, but I, there he is. What's happening? What we're doing is we're taking a wire brush and cleaning the rivet line so we can drill them off. We, you have to take, uh, you have to drill out every rivet in a Spitfire. Spitfire used a magnesium rivet. And oh. so you have to remove a little over 250,000 rivets. After a while, you get pretty good at drilling a rivet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I know. And, uh, I know. and here, we're going back together. You've drilled a few in your time. Oh, I've drilled a few. What it, it was funny. We could build a relatively simple jig for the fuselage because the way it was built, these things split in the middle. And so we could rebuild one piece, a little section, put it in, and then go to the opposite side and rebuild that section. And so we just kind of walk down. You can see here's the first section that we did. Here's a section that we're getting ready to skin and paint. And unfortunately, you've got all these damn parts. And so I used a lot of tags. What kind to, of paint do you use? Uh, well, this, it's a polyurethane paint. We used uh, they don't use zinc chromate anymore, right? Uh, well, it's zinc chromate looking, but it uh, doesn't have the zinc mm -hmm. in it anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You can use zinc chromate. Uh, uh, the Brits used a paint that they call Spitfire Green, uh, and it's not quite as shiny as the inside of my airplane. It's a primer. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, we had it duplicated, uh, and uh, 
but we made it uh, a little shinier so it doesn't get so dirty and you can wash it out with goddamn bar saw gun. Uh, it's just, you know, the, the purist criticized greatly, but uh, very frankly, uh, uh, they never have to clean it. They don't have to clean it. <laughs> well, you can't clean flat paint. You, it, you, you it just, it, it's too porous. Yeah. It just you, soaks you, in, everything soaks into it, and it looks like hell. You can't clean it. And, it's... Yeah. and uh, so, you know, we're, as we, as you can see, we just kind of walked up the front. We had to, we had to remake this frame almost entirely, and this frame almost entirely. This one here was really a bitch. And it's the one that the seat attaches to. And all of these aircraft are hand built. So you can't take parts off of one and put them on another. You, and, and, and for instance, the seat had to be fitted to the frame. And it only fits that frame. Mm. And, but here we're getting- Is that Russell? Yeah, that's Russell. He's holding the seat up for me. How much of the plane was like that? Was quite a bit of the plane handmade that everyone was unique or? Everyone was unique. Okay, the there was no like a shelf with 2,000 seats and they just bolted them in? Or? Well, uh, they made, they had dispersal sites all over England because of the bombing. Hmm. And they, somebody make uh, rib one over here, and somebody no. make rib <laughs> two over here. And when we took the first skins off of the wing, it had in it which what the Brits call packers, we call shims, and it must have had two or three hundred shims to make the thing fit. And there were shims just falling all over the floor. We had no idea where they went. And so what so so what we did is we jigged each rib, we took strings and we we left the end rib on and left this one and then yeah. struck strings and and jigged it as we went. So we only have one shim in this whole damn two <laughs> wings. But we made we made over parts that were sound from the standpoint of corrosion just because they were so poorly made. This airplane, they estimated the life of a Spitfire when this airplane was made at 25 hours of flying. And so mm. you're talking about yeah, yeah, it's disposable so item. Guys, yeah, they needed numbers of them in a big hurry. They needed them, and it took them 33,000 man hours to build one. Oh, and uh, the Germans were able to build an ME 109 using Polish slave labor, and they got it down to 6,500 man hours finally. So the Brits took five times longer to build an airplane than uh, uh, a Spit than. The Germans used on an ME 109, but the Brits had a lot of labor. They just had an incredible amount of labor that was semi, uh, wasn't skilled, but it was semi-skilled because they were, they were a country of little shops and yeah. shopkeepers, mm. and, and and so they were used to working with their hands. They, you know, they yeah. they had some knowledge of tools, mm. uh, uh, much different uh, than. It's like the uh, the mosquito. They. It worked out really, really yeah. well because they they had furniture makers, right? Make, and it's all wood. Airplane. Yeah, yeah. Make, basically all wood. wood. Airplane. Here's just you know, and this uh, the funny thing about the the tail surfaces on this airplane. This airplane is a transition airplane. The Brits invented the pop rig, and believe me, it's a hell of a good rig, and. The ones that we used on this, uh, and we used the pops where they used the pops. We used the Monel rivet instead of the uh, instead of the uh, aluminum rivet that they used, mm -hmm. and they're hell for stout. I mean, they're so strong. And uh, a few of those. and but the way they built this thing before they had the pop rivet is they would they would rivet on the top skin, and then they have these wood strips and they would take a number three wood screw, <laughs> little tiny wood screw on one inch spacing, and they would screw the bottom skin to, the to these strip. little wood strips. And that's the way you made, you made the tail surfaces on this airplane. You go out there and look, it's all screws underneath. Now that when the, when the uh, uh, stabilizer was made, when the vertical fin was made, 
It was made in some other place. And they were modern. They used the pot rib. And, uh, <laughs> and so, <laughs> but, but uh, the earlier Mark 9s, most of the Mark 9s that were made uh, after maybe the middle of 1944, they were all popped. Uh, they didn't use any of the, of the little bitty sheet metal screws. But you sit there and you sit there with a 16th drill and you have your skin on, you drill through, uh, through the hole into, into your mahogany strip and then you take and you dip it in a little bit of glue, put it in there and screw it in. The glue acts as a lubricant and it makes it much easier to screw into the, mm -hmm. into the, yeah. into the, into the thing. Kind of like model building again. Yes. Mm. <laughs> yes. exactly. A technique not foreign to yeah. us. I mean, where yeah. on earth did you get the gauges and everything else? How did you manage to find all of these? Well, I found a lot of it. I, when I bought this project, he had a, I, I bought all his spare parts too. And uh, he bought, uh, the guy that I bought the project from was a man by the name of Rude Krenz. He was a Dutchman. Uh, MK723, uh, mine's the MK959, and uh, uh, then uh, he wrecked it, and now I'm using MK723. <laughs> your parts. <laughs> He's your spare parts yeah. supplier. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but here's uh, <laughs> this is the uh, uh, the well, fabric control surfaces are alike, but they double cover. Yeah, I know the process. I've never done it. Either. And and. Two layers I, of seek out, I'm or not, what? I, it's, it, we actually used uh, we actually used polyfiber, but uh, it's the same stuff. Similar, yeah. yeah. And uh, we, uh, uh, I didn't. I, I'm no fabric. I've done one J3 Cubman my entire life, and uh, Bob Gutman is a real. He's was a the fabric original genius. Linen? Huh? Was the original the linen? linen? Yes. And when you double cover now, do you do anything? Before applying the fabric to, dump, to to bond the two fabrics together, right. or is it done one layer at a time? It's done one layer at a time. Mm. It's all stitched. It's stitched. All dope. And uh, uh, and you really can't tell it. I mean, hell, you can't tell it's one, two layers. I don't see any stitches. That's why. Yeah. Well, the stitches are covered with tape. Uh, they're taped. Yeah. Uh, in other words, you stitch them and then you put tape, put tape on the top of them. But the uh, uh, these are, you know, a lot of this stuff I got when I bought the project. He had boxes and boxes of parts, and that was helpful. Wow. Um, all these instruments, all these instruments uh, came with the project. I mean, this is kind of interesting. Uh, I had a brand new, uh, well, brand new, old uh, uh, gun camera. And, uh, but I didn't have the mount. The leading that, edge of the wing right here. Yeah, I didn't have the mount. I had everything. Well, I borrowed this from the RAF, uh, from the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight that came out of one of their old wrecks. And that's the original bracket. And this is the one we made okay. and, and put the gun camera in. It copied it. It copied it, put the gun camera in, and the gun camera sits in that wing. And, it looks through I'm that little hole. Surprised they lent it to you. They they, they, they cooperated. Well, they were they really were nice. Uh, uh, at first, they were kind of scally that mm. uh, there was a Spitfire being rebuilt in the United States. This was the first one that had ever been rebuilt from the ground up in the United States. Here we're building a wheel press. That looks easy. That's the hardest damn thing to make. And then after a while, they were Bless sorry knows. for them. They, did they? They must have cooperated. Once they found out you were serious about the project, they're doing a good job. They, they and and I would have see this airplane w was flown uh, by a number of people uh, uh, that belonged to the Spitfire Society, and and uh, taken all these pictures and uh, and. Taking them back to England and showing them, uh, you know, various things. And, but uh, this is this is when we're putting the wings on, and I used see that damn digital level there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a diabolical something. <laughs> sure. Because I'll guarantee you, 
it, 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 this this wing dihedral is six degrees plus or minus a half a degree. So you can have one degree difference. This son of a bitch, we got this thing and we got it absolutely on the money six degrees with that digital level in the morning. The the day would get hot and the goddamn wings try to straighten out and they would change their degree oh, about you'd watch it and instead of having six degrees you'd have 6.3 degrees or you'd have 5.6 degrees and if the temperature was exactly the same the next morning and the weather conditions were exactly the same as when you set the dad gun thing to six degrees it'd be six degrees that's again. when you said well Plus or minus one. <laughs> we said, That's time right. to drill that son of a bitch. <laughs> That's good enough. Bolt that puppy home. Bolt that puppy in. The original one. Oh, no doubt about that. Sure. No doubt about that. I'm so you don't know how interested Joe well, and I are in this stuff. You, you have it. no idea. Well, I guarantee you, I was tapping that sucker in, and the head came off my hammer. Oh. Well, I told Gutman, I said, Gutman, go get me another hammer, quick. Oh, you, you start well, Gutman here. can't run like a rabbit. I mean, he shuffled on in the ear and grabbed me another hammer, and by the time he got back, that son of a gun was almost, it was almost stuck. I, I, I barely got it in. I mean, I didn't think I was going to get it. <laughs> that would have been entertaining. Well, you'd have had to drill so it. Really you'd have yeah. had to drill it out and collapse the walls, pull it out. I'm interested in the, it's got invasion stripes on it. Did it come out of the of the uh, factory that way, or did you just paint it with the invasion stripes? No, no, no. Uh, they, I, I got a picture. That's of the it. way it came out. No, uh, it it was much uh, before. Let's see, I got the picture. These are just some letters about the stripes on our airplane. You include me in on any invasion stripe program. Yes, sir. <laughs> Every one of mine has to oh, 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 oh. This is this even is, my typhoon. Yeah, this is this is Andre Rose who flew it. This is a, a a watercolor that he painted. He's got it at home. It's a great big thing, about like that, and that he says is MK959. And Andre's the sole survivor. This is Andre wrote me his letter in French, so I had to translate it because he was a Frenchman and uh, uh, you know he says uh, he says for your information among the five pilots I'm the sole survivor mm -hmm. and then uh, here he is today Wow! <laughs> and uh, and this is my airplane uh, in June of 1944 with the invasion stripes painted mm -hmm. if you look in the invasion records they sent them out the night before yeah. with buckets of whitewash and black paint and and they stayed out there till the wee hours of the morning made the pilots paint them and the pilots were out there painting the damn things and, and they didn't have anything to go by just a tech order tech order that shows said they got to be so wide and they got to be so many of them and they're different interpretations that's why you have so many different stripes. and and so if you look at how rough it was where they oh, yeah, painted around the, the roundel. Uh, oh my the roundel. I mean, it was just rough. No airbrush. Right? No, no airbrush. No, 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 no airbrush. No, no masking tape. No masking tape. No windy airbrushing. No, 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 no windy video no, back so then. This is, this is Andre's wife, who's English, and uh, and of course this is this me and Andre, and this is my wife. Then this Let's, is. Can this, I see that one again? Yeah, this was. Uh, uh, this was in France. It's Andre. Yeah. Is that a squadron marking that? Yes. Uh, uh, this is the Half Stork Squadron, which was the most famous of the uh, of the uh, French squadrons during World War One. It had oh. Georges Germeyer and all of the French aces yeah, yeah, yeah. were in Half Storks, and so this was a this was a reincarnation of oh. the Half Stork Squadron, and that's why the Stork was painted on the side, and. Uh, and I, uh, these are just some pictures of the Stark emblem. This is the Stark on a Mirage today. The half Stark squadron is still surviving. And these are some of the things that I had. The original artwork. Yeah, this is, this is uh, what Andre, mm. Andre's an artist, and so he drew one for me. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, and he drew one for me, and we made a, uh, we, we made a, 
thing that we could put on the airplane. But ultimately, I found the sister ship to my Spitfire. The, it had crashed four days before, uh, it crashed on, uh, on the 9th of June in, uh, in France during, during the Normandy invasion. Mm -hmm. And the French had cut the half The squadron stork, mark out. Wow. And it was in, it was in the French Museum in Bourgeois. Wow. And so they, they allowed a friend of mine who is a museum curator, a guy by the name of Harry Vandermeer, to make a tracing of it. And, wow. and here's the thing, and, and he made a tracing, and that's what we used to put That's it's really accurate, oh, that's yeah. Great. Isn't that something? That's Whoa. amazing. And hmm. yeah, this, is, this shows uh, the, the, I never, the, the K that's on the front of the uh, cowling. Oh, right. <clears throat> they, they told me what it was like, but this was the only picture I got of it. And uh, Lambert uh, is uh, is still alive, and this is his airplane. What's and, the significance of the letter? Uh, say my airplane was was K. Somebody else's airplane may have been L, and so pilots flew a number of different airplanes. So they, okay. Because the missions on these airplanes were very short, hour and fifteen minutes, because they didn't hold any gas. Okay. And so they run across the channel, shoot up everything, and come back. When they'd come back, another pilot would jump in the airplane and they'd take it back over again. So uh, they had them painted where they would line them up and they'd say, John, you're assigned K. And, and the K would be on Easily the front of the airplane. Oh, okay. so right, right. And if you look on the side of my airplane, it says 5AK. 5A is the 329 squadron identification number. K is the airplane identification okay, number. Yeah, yeah. So they could fly up beside an airplane and they could tell his squadron and they could tell wow. what airplane he was in. And, and then if you go back and you look through the combat records, that's the way they put them in squadrons. And you'll see, you'll see uh, sometimes they'll have the letters, uh, they'll have, uh, instead of having MK959, they'll have They'll have K and A and oh, B okay, and yeah, yeah. D as the as yeah, yeah. the as the squadron. I never knew the significance of that. I had seen that before. These were later uh, uh, the Brits in early July. In July the second or third, they had a tech order come out to take the invasion stripes off the top of the wings and the top of the fuselage because they uh, they could not camouflage the aircraft. They oh. put the, the aircraft under a bunch of trees. And, and there's the invasion up, stripes. <laughs> and they cover them up with stuff, and they oh, could still okay. see the invasion stripes. So the Brits had the invasion stripes removed from the top of the wings and the top of the fuselage. And this is what resulted. Now, this is Lambert's airplane again, 5A being the squadron designation, 329, and L. Uh, and his, uh, this was actually his private airplane because he was the squadron leader at this time. I never knew, because I had seen a lot of the invasion stripes only on the bottom, and I said, well, yeah, yeah. what was that all that's, about? That's yeah, after the invasion, who needs the stripes? That's, well, but they, uh, some of Al's Mustangs only have the, the thing on the... And now, did you know that? I'm, that's news to me. This, oh, is, that this is a book that the uh, that the uh, Dutch Museum prepared for me. These are uh, plates that I removed during rebuilds that you know identify the airplane. But uh, basically, this is my airplane when it was flown in the Polish Expatriate Squadron. That's 302 Squadron. Who that when it Polish? It it started out in Poles. Then it went to the French, and then it went to 165 Squadron, which was basically a Kiwi squadron. It's Polish, that's what it's it was. It started out Polish, then went to French, and then went to. Uh, Cause your brother's uh, back there, Wendy. And then went to uh, uh, Austria. Uh, go, go to Warsaw, and you'll see how much documentation they have. Yeah. This is uh, this is the movement card, and this is when it was damaged, and it was damaged on the 28th of December on a raid on Cologne. And the guy who was flying it, uh, uh, 
I visited him. He lives on the Isle of Man, and I'm trying to remember his name now. I've just drawn a blank. But anyhow, uh, he had to set it down. Couldn't get the gear uh, gear down, and he set it down on, on, and it was pretty badly damaged. They had done a lot of a lot of this work airplane. on this airplane, uh, mm -hmm. and they put it back in shape, put a new engine in it, and then in 1946 sold it to the Dutch. But uh, uh, this uh, th this just kind of goes through. These are this is like that book there, except it just summarizes <coughs> the various. Uh, I'm curious about something. You know, we sold the United States sold 51s for just nearly nothing if you could fly them all. You know, yeah. What did this airplane sell to the Dutch for? Uh, they bought 25 uh, 25 of them for a uh, hundred and a hundred and six thousand pounds maybe at that, that time band, about three and a half three and a half dollars to, to, to the pound okay so so yeah. say three hundred thousand dollars for 25 for airplanes ten thousand dollars a piece but they were all they had all purportedly been rebuilt with new engines and, and were in, in great shape but when i took the tail apart there was a bullet hole <laughs> through the goddamn spar and they had put a patch on the top and a patch on the bottom but they never patched the hole in the spar <laughs> so the spar is not doing anything Bill was that one of your repairs <laughs> one of yours that's good enough for a pick my grandfather these, my are, dad. these are just these are some pictures this is when it was oh. at Endoven in the early in the late 1950s before it was put on a post this here was kind of an interesting scenario. Uh, the Dutch side of the air base from the British side, and the British demanded the spit to put out in front of their officers club. Well, the Dutch didn't want to give it to them. And I've got just correspondence out the butt. Finally, <laughs> uh, the Minister of Defense of, of the Netherlands said, give them the airplane. So they gave them the airplane to put out in front of their officers club. Well, one night, the Dutch got drunk, and they took a crane, and they went over and they picked the damn airplane up. This is one of the original pictures. Picked the airplane up with a crane and carted it back across to their side. Well, you've never seen so damn many paper. Uh, it's a paper nightmare. I mean, right and back and forth. And finally, they had to give the airplane back to the, to the Brits. Oh. <laughs> so when the That's Brits a funny left, story. when the Brits left Endoven. <laughs> they had a changing of the guard, and they gave the base totally back to the Dutch. And with it, they gave my airplane back. And oh, this, oh I, man, is that a story? story and this, this is wow. my airplane right here, and this is, these are the Brits, and they, uh, these are the Brits, and these are the Dutch. <laughs> and this is the changing of the guard where they gave the airplane back. Oh, and it was your airplane, that's my incredible. airplane. That's incredible. And this is the guy who he's come over here and visited uh, Jan Van Arkel, and he flew. Spitfires during World War II, and he is, he's the one that saved the airplane. And this is where it was, uh, on a post. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, and this yeah, is- it's called a gate guard. Yeah, different this wing is, tips. And uh, the, uh, the uh, Dutch took the wing tips off because it increases the rate of roll of the airplane. They used them for low level flying. If you look at the original pictures of this airplane- so the, With the wing tips, it, it rolls quicker? Without the wingtips, it rolls, rolls quicker. quicker. Okay. And if you look at the original pictures of the airplane back in 19, uh, see, <coughs> it is, in 1946, when they first gave the airplanes to the to, to the Dutch. There's a picture of it. Here's a picture of it. Here's a picture of the Dutch. This is These, uh, uh, these are some of the, uh, uh, of the first pictures of the airplanes right after in 1946 and 47. Without the tips. Uh, without the tips. And this mm. is when they, they took them off. Uh, the, the, I, have, I have some of the, of the maintenance uh, uh, mm -hmm. records and took them off, uh, the Dutch took them off in England. Why, why, uh, it, why it, would you have the tips on or if it rolls better with them off? 
It's pretty high. Yeah, well, yeah, I don't know that you can get it up there. Yeah. High, but I mean, it's the same as a 727. That's it. Really? Seven, yeah. And 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 at 40, that's 42,000 feet uh, with no pressurization. Ooh. So well, you, you better be counting some oxygen. Well, not only that. And closing. You, uh, you can barely blow the oxygen out because, you know, it's just you're having to force feed yourself with right. the oxygen. You can't hardly breathe. And this is, these are some pictures of it. Uh, this kind of shows the condition of the airplane back in, uh, oh, this was in about the 1980s when they were doing a lot of, of, of rebuild. How long did it take you to uh, rebuild this? Ten years. Wow, that's not bad. Yeah, here, here's, here's, you know, you can see what kind of that's just, that's not bad. Mind boggling. Yeah, but you know, long after we're gone, Rayburn, that airplane will be there. To people take a look at it. <laughs> that airplane will be there long after yeah, we're gone. Yeah, you can see these are the cannon bays. You can see how bad things were. How many, how many spits are actually still surviving? About 50. Oh, there's a bunch of them. Really? Yeah. Oh man. Wow. See, this was this is the, the reduction gear, yeah. and you can see the size of the crankshaft. The crankshaft here, I made a, 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 a propeller stand out of it. It's over on the other side. Oh. Because you can buy these engines, uh, you can buy the engines pretty dead. This gave me a fit. When when the Dutch were doing a rebuild on the airplane to put it back on the post, and it was corroded so bad and everything, they wanted to sandblast. The, the elevators. Since the blasting machine wasn't big enough, they cut them in half. No. Oh. And so I had to make a new spar for the damn elevators. Mm. They cut that sucker just. <laughs> Not only did they cut it in half, they cut a piece out of it about like that, because they took the bell crank and somebody ran off with the bell crank. So it, Tom Morris. So it, it was cut. <laughs> the half. Moon Brothers. It was cut, and uh, they ran. Uh, they ran off with the bell crank. Uh, so I ended up having to have that spar made by airframe assemblies because I didn't have any. Uh, I didn't have any uh, documentation. Or any jagged make off. It. Yeah, you could yeah. make a jagged. You know. Yeah, I mean, even you, a corroded one would have yeah. worked. Here's the paint. The paint. Yeah, it looks like the old mask though. Well, this is one. See, this was H15 is what it was in 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 Dutch service, and they're painting it in the in the H15 colors to put it back on the post. And these are pictures of it in its later in its later time. And it shows how it was on the post. That's the barracks for the Royal Dutch Air Force Academy there. And then... What did they replace it with? Or did they? Uh, you'll see. It's the damnest thing you ever saw in your life. This, it, it's one of the very few survivors of Operation Market's Garden. And so this is an, uh, this is an article about it. That, this, that they had it in a... Uh, they had it in a show right before I bought it because it was one of the surviving Spitfires. Was uh, uh, there's only two that I'm uh, that I'm aware of that uh, flew in Operation Marcus Garden that are still surviving, mm -hmm. and this is the only flyer. Uh, this, believe it or not, you'll see here. Okay, this is this is right here is the plastic model that was used to replace my airplane. Mm. There's the plastic model. And that damn thing is so realistic. It's How did I'm, they make that out of plastic? Yeah, it's made out of plastic. Here it is right here. And full size. Full size. And here's the factory. Here's mackerel. the factory where they made them. Yeah, they just Oh man. They up it up a piece at a time. Well, there's no I mean, internals or motor or anything. It's just no, a no, shell. No. It's a shell. Well, uh, but it looks uh, you couldn't tell. I wouldn't know. That's not the real plane. And the you, rivets and everything. Yeah, so, the rivets. Oh and everything. man, it's unbelievable. It's just they just mold it off of that in sections. And they and have they a it out, and they have a nice part. Then they glue it all together. They have a oh. structure inside it uh, that's yeah to hold it. it yeah, like, it's basically a tubing structure. Wow, to hold everything. Little in place. rods will come out to hold the panels. And and. Uh, and they, it's beautiful. 
I'm just, That's unbelievable. I, I'm finding that and, unbelievable. And here they're taking my airplane down from the post. And this is, uh, this guy right here is, uh, is Jack Von Eggman, who was the, uh, the, the guy who worked for Rudy Krenz. This is Rude Krenz. He's the guy I bought it from right here. And this is Jack. And uh, uh, this is when they gave it over to, uh, to Jack. And, you know, this is the airplane. And there it is. This is when it was at the uh, at the air show in '92, uh, because it was one of the very, very few survivors of uh, Operation Market Garden, which is their famous, you know, the, the bridge too far. If you remember the movie, uh, it was to uh, attack uh, the Germans through the Ardennes, and uh, and. Uh, uh, they they got their supply line so uh, so stretched, stretched out. out that the, the, the Germans just beat the shit out of them. They lost 75,000 troops. Now at the end of World War II, when it actually ended, how many Spitfires were there still? <laughs> I don't know. They made 22,000 of them during the entire the, the entire production schedule. I mean, did they have this them is, like Mustangs, where people were just buying them up and turning them into hot uh, rods they, and stuff? They were making. Uh, they were all so poor. Uh, yeah, the average they, Brit couldn't afford to buy they, the hubcap. And the, oh. and they were just they were tearing them up and melting them down and making pots and pans out of them. Here's the Jeez, here's here the combat. Right. Well, it was a, it was a give back thing. because they asked for people to melt, turn in their pots. And okay. Pans and melt down okay. For now it's give back time. Oh, yeah. Jesus. But here's the. I, I, while they have every scrap of paper that they've ever generated they don't have any index. And so you have to hire a guy by the name, uh, I hired a, 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 an archivist who specialized in, in that period of World War II to find these records for me. And these are the operation logs for every combat mission that the airplane flew. Ooh. And I even, have, I even have some of the debriefing notes in Polish uh, that, uh, uh, when they come back from a mission, they would debrief them. They would have an intelligence officer debrief them, and he would write this out in longhand. Well, uh, when I was practicing law, I, we had offices in, in Warsaw, and so we had a secretary that spoke Polish and wrote Polish and uh, was a translator for us. And so I gave it to her to translate. She couldn't translate it because the Polish language has changed so, so much, much in 60 mm. years because of the Russian influence. Mm. She could oh. not, I, so okay. we had to send it to some professor at the University of Walsall to get it, to get it translated because he was the only one who could read the damn thing. Yeah, you know, just unbelievable. But there's just no end to this. This is unbelievable. Well, it goes on and on. No, unbelievable. Honey's Polish, you know, you should have been able to do that kind of huh? thing. Wendy's Polish. Well, right, you got the manual. I'll translate it for you right now. Kabasi, 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 kabasi. <laughs> miles north, and the people spoke all together different dialect. Well, some of Britain. They, they do in America too. Go to North Carolina and go to Jersey. You yeah. won't understand either one of them. What? What? <laughs> what? That is an unbelievable story. I, I can't tell you. If you knew how much we were interested in Spitfires, oh, geez, so I went to England, went to, Duxford, went to Duxford, went to Duxford. And we made a special arrangement. The guy was a modeler that, that let us in after hours, let us touch all anything. We we had run into place. Of course, I got videotape of it all. And I was I came home and built six Smith farms. I mean, that, that's what <laughs> happened. <laughs> well, it uh, it is a good flying airplane. In the air, it's very pleasant to fly. It isn't very pleasant to land on concrete but it mm -hmm. is pleasant to fly. Now your exhaust manifolds, I have a funny story, you could verify it. When we were in the museum, I looked at them on the Mosquito, how they slant down and go back, because I was making a mold for them for my own model. And the guy said, in, during the war, if you walked out by the runway, you would trip on them. The planes would come back from a mission, two, three missing, missing all the time, they'd land in the grass, hit people in the head, and I thought, hmm. I check them every time I fly. Because okay, there's some I truth have, to that. Thing. I had stainless steel ones made, and they're very expensive. 
Mm. And so I, I, as part of my pre-flight, I shake each one of them yeah. to see, make sure. But, but you think there might be some truth to that? That they, oh, a flu, yeah, flu they were off. falling off all over everywhere. And on, top <laughs> that, on top of that, they were made out of carbon steel. They were not made out of stainless. So they would burn up. And so they burn up pretty quick. Oh and, man, what but, an adventure! But when you had the average life of an airplane is twenty yeah. hours. Yeah, hours, yeah. yeah. it's an arf. These are yeah. really arfs. I don't yeah. care. Yeah, I don't care. <laughs> Oh. It was a horror show. <laughs> <laughs> I heard it the back of the terrible. typhoons used to fall off in flight. Well, they, they did early on. The they, had to put, they had to put the, these they straps dumped, There was a strap, yeah, yeah, yeah. Four of them. There's four straps Whoa. that go around that airplane. That the pilots would be flying in a die guess and just, what? it'd be easy they to bail out now. Right? There's nothing back yeah. there. But the, the, uh, they lost quite a few pilots in, in, uh, in, 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 in the, the initial, in, in wow. the initial uh, when they first put them into service, wow. they had the tails fall off, and yeah. they were, and they, they, they made that change, and they, uh, they <clears> put <throat> those straps on there, and then they later strengthened the tails uh, of the typhoon. The typhoon turned out to be a damn effective, low-level aircraft, mm. and they used it primarily for attacking tanks. And Infantry mm. and things, like yeah, that. yeah, just like our Thunderbolt. You know, that's mm. basically what they used it for. But the Saber engine, but that engine was garbage. Oh man, they had all sorts of trouble with that engine. Well, you, you look oh. at how many parts, two H banks. I mean, it was just acid. and it was square. The yeah. goddamn thing looks like a box. <laughs> I mean, it don't look like an engine. Roll it looks like a box. Here, this, this way. What are they? Here. How did they lay out the cylinders on oh. that engine? It's I don't it was know. It was horizontally posed this way and down True. here. And then geared? I don't know. I've never seen that. I've seen pictures of them. And, and, and I've got they look like this goddamn, they look like this goddamn refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I that mean, is an apier saber. <laughs> wow. It was, they were a nightmare to work on. Yeah. What I enjoyed extensively was whenever I'd go to England, I, I've been there twice, and a friend of mine who's a modeler, we went and looked at the Lancaster that the guy taxis up and down the grass. Yeah. And, and I mean, we got that, the people revere the Spitfire, the Lancaster, oh, they revere it. I don't think the Americans revere the Thunderbolt and the, no. I, I don't think, but uh, that the made me don't sad. Anything. No, that made me sad. You know, my, uh, when, uh, when they held the last, they held the last reunion of 302 Squadron, which my airplane is the only surviving Spitfire of 302 Squadron. And, uh, they, uh, uh, I had, I sent them videotapes and I flew the damn thing around and had videotapes and everything. Mm. All these old guys, and one of the pilots is still alive. And, well, from uh, World War II? From World War II, they flew Ooh. my airplane. And, Whoa! And, he must be and, in his 80s, right? Yeah, oh, he's, he's got to be John uh, DeTavio. Uh, Andre's 86, and uh, I guess, uh, I guess Noir. Uh, it's an unbelievable is, story, isn't it? Noir like must be. At least 86, because he he had been a pilot in the uh, in the in the uh, Polish army and then had escaped and and had come to England in 1939 when uh, when uh, when the Germany overran Poland. Yeah, so, I was born I was born in Britain during the war. I'm, I'm British. Wow. I was born I in Scotland. Yeah, I was born in Scotland. Scotland. Scottish. But. Wow. Uh, but anyhow, it was. Uh, it's been. It's been a pretty interesting. What an interesting adventure, study, though, to do. Study of history. To do this oh, yeah. is like the guy that's digging up the Titanic. I mean, to me, that's yeah. it, you're going and get. And imagine if they could bring it up somehow, and Fine. that well, that would be what I, the only thing I could relate this to—a labor of love like this. Unbelievable. So thank you very much to our late friend Bill Rutherford that made the arrangements that we got this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to visit this Spitfire and learn about its restoration and history. I find it a, an incredible story. One that I, this, this whole story would be worthy of a, uh, a professional video on one of the public TV channels. I didn't know a lot of the facts I learned today and seeing this Spitfire in real life, being able to touch it, see some of the unique details and some of the things that went into it, absolutely amazing. So if you enjoyed the video, hit the like button and thanks so much for watching.